For carbon market in Durham, Jackson Orwin, senior fellow at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. Meanwhile, we are also joined in Beijing, Zhao Xiaolu, climate director with the Environmental Defense Fund's China program. In Beijing, Ma Jun, director of the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs. And last but not least, Yi Yangshen, director of Inclusive Development Research Center. Great to see all of you. Mr. Ma, I want to start with you. After expecting for a long time, finally, China's the first ever carbon trading market began trading last Friday. Tell me more about whether after following it for a long time, preparing for it, satisfied with the first day of operation. Yeah, the first day of operation got everyone excited. It's, uh, it's went on smoothly with uh, uh, quite a uh, volume of trade and uh, the, uh, the carbon price also set at the, the level that uh, people, uh, uh, experts predicted. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this price is uh, extremely low in comparison with, uh, ex uh, especially with the mature market uh, uh, of, uh, of EU trading system. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, EU also got a long period of uh, of low price, and uh, I think this um, uh, the the regulator doesn't want it to be either too high or too low. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have to say, at this moment, it, they they want the trade system to to help with uh, China's carbon emission reduction, but doesn't want it to compromise to have it compromise any of our economic development. Well, the U.S. does not have a national emissions trading system. It has a series of subnational systems similar in some ways to the pilot systems that China had rolled out previously to this national launch. So in that regard, China has taken a step forward on national carbon pricing that the U.S. has thus far resisted. Mm. Looking at China, Mr. Ma, you know, the data is a big issue um, because without assessment, without ability to go back and look at the data, uh, there's, you know, whether you have a carbon market or not, it really doesn't make sense. So you work at the very beginning on the data issue. How is it so far? Actually, more than five years, we've been trying to uh, uh, advocate for the uh, for for the disclosure of the uh, carbon emission data. Um, so far, some progress have been made. You know, the temporary rules of this uh, car cap and trade market uh, uh, requires uh, major emitters uh, joining this uh, program to to disclose their carbon emission data. Uh, having said that, most of them have not fulfilled this uh, requirement yet, and. Um, uh, but, but it's encouraging to see five provinces uh, started uh, disclosing some of the large emitters uh, 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 carbon, carbon data. Mm. And what are these five provinces? Them. Could you name them? They're, they're not all in the coastal developed uh, regions. Uh, uh, actually, you know, uh, some of the Western regions uh, mm -hmm. uh, have been the uh, front runner, like Sichuan, you know, including Sichuan and Shanxi and uh, Shanxi. Shanxi and Jiangxi and uh, this kind of provinces mm -hmm. and um, and and we have compiled this data uh, so this uh, there's a clear gap in the uh, in in the disclosure and also in the accounting so I think you know without a uh, a, a, a a open source uh, you know disclosure of this right. uh, ca carbon data uh, this market can hardly fulfill its uh, uh, it, it, its goal to reduce help uh, reduce the carbon uh, emission uh, with uh, uh, in a more uh, cost effective way so our cap and treat even with the cap is a cap on the uh, based on intensity mm -hmm. control and not not on absolute volume right so this leaves uh, in theory some space for the for the late comers uh, to uh, continue to to develop uh, continue to right. you know before they pick their carbon emission mr shen the issue is about a balance right and the rhythm you know the economic development this time with the pandemic and everything and the geopolitic things needs to be uh, further considered. Uh, it's not uh, like a black and white issue. So how, how do you look at the pace and the balance issue? Well, uh, this is uh, definitely a big concern for, you know, Western provinces 
including a lot of uh, developing country, I mean those African and uh, South Asia, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, I think uh, there uh, there are there will be solution for this. For example, in Western China, so their economic development is uh, is not that you know advanced comparing the coastal cities. Mm. However, you know Western provinces uh, they are they have big resource for solar and wind. So in the future, I mean, developing those clean energy in Western provinces will uh, get, uh, I think, bigger benefits for them, especially through the carbon trading system. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this will be good for them. Uh, we have to also, you know, taking care of uh, so-called uh, inclusive growth issues uh, for Western provinces. Uh, China now building, you know, great railway system, great road system, and also the, I think the consumption market in China is also going to be unified. I've actually noticed a very interesting um, evidence. Um, while talking with aluminum sectors, a lot of the companies or the plants are actually moving to the west part of the China because they have significant uh, renewable resources. Um, and the, although they are not included in the current power uh, ET, national carbon market, uh, they are expected to, to be included soon. So there's already um, climate change are becoming a more and more significant decision power of their uh, company strategic planning. Mm -hmm. So let me go to you, Mr. Oering, about that too. You know, every country has their own development stage, right? China's economy, as we mentioned earlier, already has its uniqueness. So how do you see looking from afar, uh, you know, this time, the balance and the reason thing? The important consideration at this moment in time on that question is about what policies are most impactful on China's environmental and economic performance. And when we look at that, we see a number of uh, pollution regulation um, measures, a number of plans through the five-year plan, for example, the carbon peaking plan for 2030, the net neutrality target for 2060, uh, all of which are having these sorts of effects on the strategic planning of companies uh, and on their environmental performance. The vision for the carbon market is that over time, the uh, standards and um, uh, requirements that it places on these companies will become stricter and stricter. I don't think that it's there yet, nor is it intended to be. But ultimately, it is designed to be a flexible tool to try to balance the economic growth needs, not only of the highly developed eastern and southern cities and provinces, um, but a tool that can be complementary in ways that brings the strengths of the different parts of China's economy together. And final okay. point to note is that the pilots were designed with that in mind and covered different cities, different provinces that had different economic and social characteristics mm -hmm. to give some lessons about how this market could operate in different parts of the country. You need other policy tools to, if you truly want to have a more uh, inclusive and balanced uh, development. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, Beijing uh, in our index assessment uh, has been the, the front runner among all the provinces. Uh, but um, uh, uh, because we have phased out all the coal power plants uh, having said that, uh, you know, Beijing now is dependent uh, more than 70 percent of, uh, uh, of its power electricity uh, from major uh, intensive, uh, carbon intensive uh, provinces uh, right. like uh, Inner Mongolia, Shanxi and Hebei. Uh, and so now most of the power we uh, imported uh, into Beijing are, uh, are actually based on coal power. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need a, to create, we suggest that there, there should be a policy uh, for the requirements of increasing proportion of, uh, of grain electricity the, mm. uh, based on renewables. Actually, you know, in, the, in those Western regions, especially in the Mongolia, it has a very, very good uh, uh, capacity, you know, resources on um, uh, solar power, wind power, uh, of course, coal power as well, but now it only want to focus on coal power because it's a much easier path toward economic development. Let me ask you, Mr. Ma, since you're an expert, you probably have all the numbers in mind. I was told by some estimates, 2030-2060 agenda commitment, 
Fifty percent, as we know today, with the current technology, with renewable energy, and with policy shifting, likely to be achieved. There are also 50 percent that's almost impossible to be achieved with the current technological development and innovation, which means we'll have to wait and see what's going to happen. So tell me more about what do we know and what we don't know. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, to I mean, that's why uh, we uh, call this 40-year-long commitment right. uh, ambitious, uh, because now we're we're having more than 10 billion tons of carbon emission that we need to neutralize. Uh, as you said, part of that we know that, like the uh, like on the power industry, mm -hmm. you know, we know the path already. But to some other industries, like on the uh, on, on the iron, steel, cement. Uh, we're, we're not that clear, you know, mm -hmm. transportation, building, lifestyle, you know, there, there are many uncertainties here. Uh, so innovative solutions uh, must be uh, the, uh, you know, innovate, innovation must be the real solutions. Uh, so how to generate that incentive? I think right. this uh, uh, market solution is very, very important. Cap and trade is one of them. Green finance and green, con, uh, green supply chain, uh, all this, uh, are all market-based solutions that we need to look into. Mm. Um, I'm actually want to second uh, Mr. Ma's point. Uh, car the value of China launching a national carbon means China finally has a price of carbon. So that means not only the power generation company will be influenced, all of the financial sectors are looking at this. Um, so they will use the price as their determination for investment for the future. Mm -hmm. For example, a coal power plant will last for 40, 50 or 60 years with price of carbon. This investment are no longer valuable. You have the labor cost, you have the raw material cost. You also have transportation logistic cost. And of course, the uh, uh, system system cost in a way. You know how system governance uh, is being done in different markets. That's how you think about businesses. But now there's one extra thing that's called carbon price coming in, not only just within your own national border, but also beyond to the region and worldwide. Hopefully, so what would that mean for you know logic of business? That's a very interesting thing, Mr. Irwin. Certainly, fundamentally, it's a recognition that we have to price the externalities of our business activities if we want to see them decline, uh, particularly for negative externalities like greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. You mentioned that this extends beyond China's borders or the borders of any country, and that brings into question the importance of where we might see intersections of carbon pricing with international trade. Mm. There's already signs through Europe's carbon border adjustment mechanism policy, which was just released last week, right. um, that this will have a growing footprint, not only in bilateral trade relationships, but in multilateral accounting all, all across the embedded greenhouse gas emissions and traded products. Um, and ultimately uh, on up to the fully international level at the World Trade Organization. It, when I mentioned the WTO, one of the avenues that I refer to is the fact that the carbon border adjustment measures put in place by the European Union and potentially put in place by the U.S. and other countries in the future will likely be challenged at the WTO along those grounds. It will be argued that they're simply trying to protect domestic industry um, rather than really uh, seeking to reduce the greenhouse gas footprint of their mm -hmm. importations. So it's by no means an easy pathway forward. Um, but one of the important outstanding issues that continues to be negotiated through the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change also intersects with this issue area mm -hmm. in that it seeks to find ways to share mitigation outcomes, essentially trade carbon credits across different borders right. uh, and have those accounted for in the international system effectively. It's been a sticking point in negotiations really since the Paris Agreement, um, but there is some optimism that oh, either this year or in the, the years to come, we'll find some system uh, that can can meet all of the demands there. Yeah. So how are we going to see the largest, uh, one of the largest trading countries in the world 
uh, having its uh, impact on the trade policy regarding carbon. I mean, this is uh, one of the most going to be one of the most sticking point we're going to see in trade negotiations and beyond, and geopolitics as well. And so there are some in the U.S. policy apparatus that would argue that this equates to a shadow carbon price um, and, in fact, a, a recognition of the need to reduce carbon in both the products that are produced and consumed in the U.S. and those that are produced and exported. And so that should be recognized in these sorts of trade arrangements that are made um, that relate to, to embedded greenhouse gas emissions themselves. All right. Uh, it's if I, certainly if I could, if I could getting just, the... Uh, yeah. With my ignorance of the expert uh, T's uh, knowledge, uh, what is the carbon trading price uh, for the U.S. market if you say there is something like a shadow pricing? What exactly is it recently? That's a good question. There is no answer at mm. present um, because that is being debated and calculated um, as a potential response to the future European carbon border adjustment. It's not a calculation that has ever had to be made for the sorts of trade arrangements that we're talking about now. Very interesting situations. Uh, uh, Mr. Shen. Yes. Also about this, uh, about uh, trade and carbon trading, uh, very much likely it's going to be the sticking point. Uh, as someone who's been working uh, as an energy consultant for Asian Development Bank earlier, what do you think about that? I think in the future, there will be definitely a lot of Chinese companies which cannot fulfill all these requirements uh, will be affected by these uh, measures. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we also have early births, those uh, Chinese companies or even companies from Vietnam, from India, those developing countries, they can, you know, catch the opportunity become green and also they have the mechanism to reduce the carbon emission mm -hmm. and set up this, uh, this carbon, uh, how to say, assets, uh, then they will be, you know, catch more opportunities for the market. Yeah, I think uh, it will not, uh, not uh, uh, a, a very bad thing. Uh, I think it will be encouraging uh, those companies mm. who will who want to become green and they will catch the opportunities. Mr. Ma, final points from you as well. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, because the EU have a more stringent uh, policy and a higher price, carbon price, so it, 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 it concerned that uh, this may lead to a carbon leakage. So they want to have a border adjustment tax. Uh, um, and, uh, and those companies uh, su supply, especially part of the global supply chain in mm -hmm. China, must be prepared for that. Recently, we have, uh, we have seen many of them coming to us, you know, to uh, try to uh, take advantage of our digital carbon accounting platform uh, mm -hmm. to first uh, understand how much they emit and then set the science-based target based on that. I think this, this is a good start for the preparation of something that that will happen. It's a very exciting start. First, uh, China's uh, trading market uh, began operation last Friday. Certainly, it's also the largest in the world already. So we'll see how things will evolve from here. It's not just about the carbon emission. It's also about how we look at where our industrial policies will be and, and how our economic uh, planning will be like uh, for all of us. Uh, thank you so much for every one of you for your contribution. Thank you.